Hey, how's it going? So, uh, this shouldn't be too weird. <laughs> what culture, 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 what Ha 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 ha! Welcome back to Castle Dugula! I hope you're ready for some chilling thrills as we discuss the gruesome, the awful, the horrific blood, and those who suck it. Suck it! Oh. Vampires are everywhere! I don't like horror comics. You like this one, Mr. Phoenix. Well, it could save your life. And it seems they have been all along slurping streams of sanguine sustenance in order to survive an unending, undead lifespan. Ha 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 ha. Count Dracula is likely the most common cultural touchstone we have when it comes to vampires. I am Dracula. But vampires, along with blood magic and blood rituals and blood sacrifices, have been part of humanity's story since near the beginning. In fact, almost every ancient culture took part in some kind of blood ritual or sacrifice. Pre-biblical people, ancient Mesopotamians, Egyptians, and Europeans, native tribes from North and South America, cultures in India, Asia, and Africa, every inch of the globe has a blood-stained past. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Likewise, the tales of supernatural beings consuming the blood and flesh of the living have been found in nearly every culture around the world for many centuries. Though the term vampire didn't exist in ancient times, blood drinking, flesh eating, and similar activities were attributed to demons. Even the devil was considered synonymous with the vampire. The term vampire was popularized in Western Europe in the 18th century as a mass hysteria followed a revived belief in vampirism in the Balkans and Eastern Europe, which led in some cases to corpses being staked and to people being accused of vampirism. <laughs> the symbolism should be pretty obvious to all of us. If your blood stays inside your body, you live. And if your blood leaves your body, you die. It's super easy to understand that blood is tied directly and inextricably to life in pretty much every living being. The use of this central fluid as a magic ingredient adds perceived additional personal power to spells and rites which include it. We see in the vampire a parasitic creature stealing life by stealing blood. Bram Stoker, author of Dracula, was a progressive Irish Protestant who saw in the rise of science a foil to the superstitious religious nature of the Victorian times. Stoker launches Dracula into a culture that was fascinated with vampires, as we've said before. Stoker forces the Count out of his dark old country castle, representative of fearful superstition, and he brings him into the modern bustling city of London as the forces of antiquity and modernity, superstition and science Face off, Dracula is a cultural story. Many things could be said to have influenced Stoker. There's old Vlad Tepish, the Romanian ruler who filled his enemies with fear by decorating his borders with shish kebabbed prisoners. Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman accused of torturing, bleeding, and cannibalizing her young female victims. And there were many, many more. But ultimately, Stoker was modernizing and retelling folk tales which may have been part of the human experience since its dawn. And, as we've stated, most cultures have some history involving the use of blood as a means to traffic in the supernatural. Blood to appease a deity, blood to guarantee a crop, or blood to empower a magic spell. Though many believed blood held power, the ancient Hebrews may have been among the first to codify a philosophy of blood. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. 
If you read the Old Testament, you'll find it brutal and bloody, and not just from battles and the violence among humanity, but also because of a constant stream of animal sacrifices and bloodshed that were required to deal with the sins of the Hebrew people. That system went on for over a thousand years. The blood was not shed for personal power or even to placate a deity. In the Hebrew mind, blood is required to wash away wrongdoing. Blood is life and blood is cleanser. A big shift comes, as with all things, when Jesus shows up in the New Testament. The New Testament agrees with the Old Testament in saying in Hebrews 9.22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding blood, there is no forgiveness. The bigger change comes when we hear in Romans 3.25 that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And Jesus adds yet another new wrinkle when he says in John 6, verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Eternal life through the drinking of blood. There you have it. Now, we won't deep dive into all the theology of transubstantiation and consubstantiation or symbolism or however you want to chop this up. The main thrust that we want to draw a line under is simply this. When it comes to the idea of gaining eternal life through the drinking of blood, Jesus is the originator. Way out ahead of Bram Stoker, Elizabeth Bathory, or even bad old Vlad Tepish. By at least a thousand years, and Jesus isn't trying to take your blood or anyone else's to sustain his life. He is trying to cleanse you with his blood so that you can enjoy eternal life through him and with him. He was the sacrifice and only his blood can clean your sin. Now, if we back up and consider those original vampire stories of the undead feeding on the blood of the living to gain false life, we can see vampires as evil personified, mocking the work of Christ, distorting the truth to insult and confuse. As the vampire arises in our culture, we'll see him used to tell other stories as well. Nosferatu was one of the first films ever to retell the Dracula story. The film was adapted by its German makers to be set in Germany, with German cast, German characters, and German settings. Count Orlok, the vampire in this adaptation, is a ghastly, bald, mole-looking creature with a hooked nose and long, claw-like fingers. When we consider that this film was made in the 1920s, right between World War I and World War II, and that similar physical traits were used in anti-Jewish propaganda of the day, we can see another cultural story. The vampire, or bloodsucker in this case, is recast as the dreaded Jew. In 1931, Bela Lugosi's iconic Dracula becomes the slick, sophisticated, tuxedo-clad standard form we all accepted for generations. This is an American version of Dracula, so the villain is now clad in the attire of old world European wealth, or perhaps the robber barons of the early American industrial age. We are firmly in the Dust Bowl days of the Great Depression, and so the villain shifts to personify what is considered the evil of the time, the wealthy. Interesting how horror films tend to surge during times of national upheaval. Anyway, that same Dracula ruled throughout the 30s and 40s. Then Hammer Films comes along with Bargain Basement Dracula starting in the early 1950s and running all the way through the 70s. The kitsch and the camp of the 60s and 70s gave us farce Dracula like Billy the Kid vs. Dracula or Blackula or the Fearless Vampire Killers or Dark Shadows on TV or Love at First Bite, the Disco Dracula. All of these echo Stoker while portraying a somewhat benign and out-of-step vampire struggling to fit in in a modern paradigm. That era of the sexual revolution, drug experimentation, and alternative lifestyles had taught us as a culture that evil was no longer to be feared. It was funny. It was something to be played with. Then, the 80s and 90s shifted the vampire narrative yet again. And now, the roles would be reversed, as youth culture would embrace the vampire, and vampires would embrace youth culture. Thanks in part to films like The Lost Boys, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Interview with the Vampire, and Blade. The vampire became the cool kid, the loner, the rebel, 
the misunderstood misfit, and in turn, the world of normalcy which surrounds vampire culture, is now the old, ignorant, out-of-touch group. The vampire is recast as an anti-hero in a world that just doesn't understand. It's easy to see how all this set the stage for... Twilight. No longer an unspeakable undead terror stalking the nightmare hours. Now, they're pretty, they're sparkly, and unharmed by sunlight. The vampires we fear could never go out in daylight. They could only be killed with a stake through the heart, beheading, or fire. They could only be hindered by a crucifix, garlic, or holy water. Today, their greatest foe is teen angst. And so Dracula has been reimagined and reinvented into the image of pervasive youth culture. The vampire is no longer the undead evil lurking in the shadows. The unspeakable formless thing we all fear has now been recast as a blue-haired skate barista whose parents and teachers just don't get it. It's not evil, it's just misunderstood. That message is a truly subversive one. The idea that evil isn't really evil, it's just misunderstood. That is the banana peel at the top of the ski slope. The loss of life, peace, wealth, morals, standards, ideals, and much more start with the idea that evil isn't really evil. It seems like I remember a snake trying to tell somebody something like that once. And thank you for watching today. Please feel free to comment on this video or any other video we have made. Please also tell us about your favorite vampire films and TV shows. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, join us again next time. But uh, for now, I've got to get some sleep. Uh, guys? I can't call you guys, can't I? <laughs> what time is it anyway? <laughs> Soinks! <laughs>